Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Norcross, and welcome to our podcast. Luke Doris is not here today. He's uh, doing the weather this afternoon, so you've just got me. This is podcast number four of Hurricane Season 2020. It's podcast number 42 in our series here called Brian Norcross Podcast. Today, we're going to talk with Dr. Jeff Masters. Now, for many years, Jeff published the preeminent weather blog. You probably know it if you're a, a weather-interested person like uh, many of you are that listen to this podcast. You know uh, Dr. Jeff Masters from Weather Underground or Wonderground.com. He did over 3,000 blogs on that site and really was uh, kind of the number one blogger, I think, for weather uh, during those years. He's got a new location for his blogs now. We'll talk about that. He's also written a book and has a rich and accomplished background in hurricane science, climate science, and meteorology in general. So we'll talk to Jeff Masters in just a few minutes. We have a lot to talk to him about. We're recording this on Wednesday, July 15th, 2020, if you're listening at some point in the future. For the latest weather, tune into Channel 10 in South Florida or Local10.com because uh, Local 10 News on Channel 10 also streams live on Local 10 Dot com. And also, there's the Max Tracker Hurricane app and the Local 10 Weather Authority app, and you get the current weather, current information, current alerts, and everything else. And on Local10.com, if you go on to Local10.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. It's called From Brian Norcross, and I'll keep you up to date on what's going on. Uh, during hurricane season, I publish it just about every morning or certainly every day that there's something that uh, we need to pay attention to. And that'll be emailed directly to you. And uh, if there's something really going on, we actually do more than one a day. So go on local10.com and sign up uh, for that uh, right now and look forward to you getting what I write. Uh, so let's talk about the tropics right now. Another tropical system a non-tropical system, this time turns into Tropical Storm Fay. It's the same system that spawned Tropical Storm Edward uh, before that. So it's been a crazy year. All these non-tropical to tropical enough systems uh, to make pre predicting them really difficult. So they've been tropical enough for the National Hurricane Center to name them. But they all started out as something besides the tropical system. So all this has nothing to do with what's going to happen in August, September, and October out in the tropics. This is all non-tropical stuff. Now, we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Jeff Masters about this in just a minute, get his opinion on why this is happening. Is it in any way related to climate? What's it related to? We'll talk to him about that in just a few minutes. The average date for the sixth storm, Faye being the sixth storm, the F storm, is August 29th. And here we are in the middle of July and we're already there. Now, that's using the modern era stats going back to 1991. Dr. Phil Klotzbach uh, figured these up for me. And it's better, I think, if we use the modern era as opposed to the official era. The official era is 1981 to 2010, because in the modern era, we name more storms now. We have better technology now. So it's a little bit more apples to apples if we use the modern era. But still, we're way ahead of normal, even for the uh, modern era. As I said, Dr. Phil Klotzbach, who's, of course, famous for making the seasonal hurricane forecasts at Colorado State University. And he'll be on with us here on the podcast in just a couple of weeks. So out there in the tropics right now, they are covered with dust, uh, there's a model that we use, a computer forecast model. It's called the NASA GEOS 5 model. It's forecasting dust to be out there for another week uh, or 10 days with a couple little exceptions. There are a couple pockets of moisture that are forecast to move across uh, Florida, one coming up here just this weekend. And that's related to high pressure building over the Atlantic, building back over the Atlantic and kind of a more normal summertime kind of scenario where the breeze comes in from the ocean. It's not coming from the Gulf. It's coming from the Atlantic Ocean, and it'll make the weather in South Florida more like normal night and morning showers and thunderstorms, and then more afternoon sunshine with a breeze. So we should not be getting those uh, looking forward to. Okay, let's uh, bring in Dr. Jeff Masters. So Jeff came from the University of Michigan where he got his uh, PhD. He was involved in the founding 
of uh, Weather Underground, the uh, famous weather website that we all used to get our weather data from. Uh, he was the most famous blogger in the weather world uh, on the Internet and lots of other important things. So uh, let's bring in Jeff now. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the podcast. Now, there's so much that you and I can talk about. We've been around a long time. But before we get started, let's talk about this uh, hurricane season so far, even though we haven't had any hurricanes. But this season so far, where we've had six named storms, all came from non-tropical roots. I mean, six is kind of off the charts for this uh, far into the hurricane season. What do you take that uh, as? Do you take that as anything? Do you put any any uh, sort of, do you think it's evidence of anything that, that we should take note of? Or is it just that there's been general low pressure over the East Coast and that's created an environment for systems to develop over the Gulf Stream, more or less? Yeah, a couple things. Like you said, we've had a weather pattern very favorable to generating these kinds of you know weak offshore storms. Warmer ocean temperatures due to continued global warming and just natural variability are contributing. And also we have to remember that maybe 30, 40 years ago, a few of these we would not have identified mm -hmm. right. because we didn't have satellite technology back then. So maybe only four of these would have actually gotten named back in, say, 1960. And some of them only had uh, were only for a few hours. They were named for a few hours. And <laughs> back in yeah. the day, we wouldn't necessarily have named storms that were going to be that short-lived. Yeah, yeah, shorties we call them. But uh, <laughs> yeah. we did have three U.S. landfalling storms. Those all would have gotten named, I think. You know, there's a, obviously, uh, I don't know how many agencies now, a couple dozen uh, universities and various agencies make seasonal hurricane forecasts. But my sense is that these kinds of storms are essentially unforecastable in terms of whether they're going to occur in a season or not when you're trying to do this back in the spring or even in, in June. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's probably the case. I mean, when you're going to make one of those seasonal forecasts, you're probably going to say, well, I need to throw in two or three of these little short-lived, you know, coastal sorts of storms that are no big deal just to, you know, pad the numbers because we always see these. Right, exactly. And one of the other things that's very bizarre this year uh, that has maybe a climate connection is that going back now, here we are recording on July 15th, and going back to June 6th, there has not been a hurricane-strength tropical system in the world in the Northern Hemisphere, right? Hmm. And there's never been in the satellite era, going back to 1966, a hmm. time, uh, Dr. Phil Klotzbach did this calculation, uh, a time since June 6th with no uh, typhoon-strength, hurricane-strength systems. Uh, pretty strange, pretty interesting. I wonder if it's a yeah, climate it's thing, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, we're tending towards La Nina sorts of conditions in the Pacific, cooler waters there. And we know that that does tend to reduce the numbers of storms we get in the Pacific. So that's part of it. And uh, yeah, I don't know other than that, it, yeah. from a climate perspective, why we might be seeing this sorts of activity. Well, La Nina affects more the eastern Pacific, doesn't it? Does it affect the number of typhoons in the western Pacific as well? I thought there was actually kind of an enhanced, you know, an enhanced thunderstorm development uh, scenario in the Western Pacific or around Southeast Asia, you know, in, and in the Indian Ocean and so forth. It does affect the Western Pacific as well. I mean, your all-time record for number of Cat 5s in the Western Pacific was set in the strong El Nino year of 1997. There were, I true. think, 11 Cat 5s that year. Right, so right, true. there is an influence, not as pronounced as, like you said, for the Eastern Pacific. All right. All right, let's go back uh, 30 years. Uh, you were a Ph.D. student uh, uh, candidate at the University of Michigan, and you worked on a project uh, – because uh, it became a weather website that weather intense people absolutely love, Weather Underground or Wonderground.com. How did that come together? Because that was actually before there was an internet, right? It was Telnet, I, I guess. <laughs> because when, when did the World Wide Web come along? 95, I, I think, yeah, more 95. or less, right? So this was uh, even before that. So uh, how, did, how did that start? And was that really what your focus was at that time? Or was it a side project? Hmm. It was a side project. I mean, I was going back to Ph.D. school to get my degree in air pollution meteorology. And when I got into the university system back in uh, 1990, 91, 
I found out about this cool thing called the Internet, where <laughs> you know you could go and get all this great information. And we had a, a satellite dish on a roof that brought in the National Weather Service feeds, and we didn't have any way to take all that great data and display it. So for a class project for a interactive weather computing course I took under Dr. Perry Sampson, I wrote a little program to take the data, format it, and allow anybody to type in a three-letter code for an airport, say MIA for Miami, and bring up the latest data and National Weather Service forecast. So from that humble beginning, uh, Dr. Sampson said, hey, you know, this is a great thing the National Science Foundation would be interested in because they really want to push the internet. And here we are, we can do science education using the internet in real time, mm -hmm. doing meteorology. And that's kind of like the ideal application for the internet and science, something real time like meteorology. So he went off and secured a few grants from the National Science Foundation, and it just took off from there. Wow. And then somehow you connected with my friend Alan Sternberg and uh, the company was formed and you were the, the science guy in the company. And I guess he was kind of the, the programming and business guy because I know Alan was involved in the beginning of Google, too. I mean, he's an amazing guy. So how did the, the company that we came to know as uh, Weather Underground and the website that we uh, came to know based in San Francisco, how did that all come together? Yeah, Perry had a couple of undergrad students who were computer science people. One was Alan Sternberg and the other was Chris Schwerzler. And they advised him on how to do things better. I mean, Perry said he wanted to use uh, an old software language called HyperCard to do graphics on the Internet. And Alan said, no, 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 no. We're going to write this in C, high level language. We're going to do it right. <laughs> so he and Chris Schwerzler wrote some C software. And when in 1995, when the commercial Internet came along, you know, th those guys said, hey, you know, let's make our own website and then let's take it off campus and, and spin it off as a business because we see a lot of potential here. So in 95, when we were all still students at the University of Michigan, Weather Underground Inc. was born. And for the first couple of years, we just ran it, uh, you know, with no salary for ourselves, just as a you know popular website trying to gain a lot of page views. And then eventually it ended up because I, I remember, I mean, this is much later way after this, that. I was at the office south of Market in San Francisco, and it was a, and I was working at the Weather Channel then. But it was a real kind of startup with a room full of computers with wires going everywhere. And but we all used it every, every day, I and mean, it was an amazing, amazing thing. Was that did Alan take it to San Francisco? Because you're basically a Michigan guy, right? Yeah, I mean, it started at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. but when uh, Alan and Chris graduated uh, in 1997, they went out to the Bay Area, and we quickly realized that if we're going to have a successful internet company, we need to base it in the Bay Area because that's the only place where bandwidth is cheap enough to be able to sustain a, a, a business model. Right. So we put our servers mm -hmm. in California. And I stayed back in Michigan along with Jeff Ferguson, who was running the business side of things. So we, we grew up over two centers. We hired uh, all of our tech guys in California, and then the business side of things was run in Ann Arbor. Well, it was a, a great, great site. It must have been really difficult for you after kind of birthing it to see what happened uh, over time when IBM bought it and it became uh, involved in sort of a, a corporate situation and they made decisions to uh, cut it back into a, to what it is today. I imagine that was hard. Yeah, that's kind of the evolution. If you are successful as a company and you sell it to a large entity, uh, you lose a lot of the distinctiveness of what you've created. And, uh, you know, that was not a surprise to see something like that happen. I mean, it was a, a waste because there was a lot of creative and you know, cool stuff that Weather Underground was doing that has been lost now. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So that's kind of the data side of it. But... You really became famous in the meteorological world because of your blog. Uh, I think that's how most people that are weather intense people know your name. How did the blog get started yeah, uh, 3,000 plus blogs ago? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it started back in 2005 in the spring. And one of our programmers said, uh, hey, there's this this new software I've written called a blog. And you know, we want you to start writing about the weather on the website. And I looked, they looked at him and said, blog? That sounds 
kind of stupid. Yeah, this I didn't is, like that word when I first heard idea. it, by the way. <laughs> right. I didn't like it. Yeah, I thought it was a stupid idea. I was like, mm. okay, well, I'll, you know, just do a few token posts here and see how it goes. So back in April 2005, I wrote a post about, you know, rainbows actually being full circles instead of arcs. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then my second post, I, I was having trouble coming up with ideas. I wrote a, just a two sentence post with the misspellings and I was like, not trying at all. And the guy started getting on my case like, okay, come on, put some effort into it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, I need something good to talk about. Well, finally, uh, AccuWeather, our competitors came out with this terrible bill that they wanted to push through Congress to basically privatize the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. I remember. So yeah. I said, you know, hey, this is great you know, that I got something to talk about. This is a really horrible thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, by generating a little PR, maybe I can get some opposition to this. And yeah, that post got a lot of page views. People wrote their senators and reps about you know, this terrible idea. And from then on, the blog just mushroomed, particularly when we started getting into the meat of the hurricane season of 2005. Right, so you started in April and then this is the year that the tropics exploded uh, in a very bizarre way. People forget that that these storms didn't form over by Africa. They all formed just offshore here. I mean, it was a, you know, I was on the air 55 of 57 days, averaging 13 hours a day between Katrina and uh, Wilma. So you covered uh, Katrina, uh, Rita, Sandy, uh, Wilma. You, you know, you've covered all these big storms. Do you remember when you thought that you needed to cover climate as well as weather events? And, and what, you know, of all the things that you've covered, what really stood out to you? Sure. I mean, one of the reasons I was amenable to doing this blogging thing is because I wanted to talk about climate. In fact, I'd put out a couple of articles uh, in pre previous years that we featured on the website, basically blog posts, where I talked about climate and how it's changing. So, yeah, when there's not an extreme weather event to talk about, or even when there is, I try and bring in climate, particularly to talk about the connection between extreme weather and climate, because we are certainly seeing an increase in some types of extreme weather events due to climate, and it's only going to increase. So we need to know, you know, in a historical context, how is this extreme weather event rated and how can we expect it to change in the future as the climate continues to warm? All right. So let's talk specifically about that. Uh, there were a number of studies on Harvey, for example, in terms of its speed of motion and the amount of rain and so forth. But uh, pick a couple of, of really uh, prominent or well-researched events that you've written about that, to connect climate and the effects uh, on the U.S.? Well, the obvious one is heat waves. I mean, we're mm -hmm. sure we're seeing <clears throat> more intense heat waves and longer lasting uh, due to climate change. That's that's kind of a no brainer. So I talk about that. Uh, fires, wildfires is another one. I mean, we've seen some crazy wildfires in California over the past few years. Uh, some of them $15 billion, $25 billion disasters. Yeah, the Paradise insane. Fire. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was over 15 billion. And right. last year we had uh, one near LA that was 25 billion. Mm -hmm. We've never seen those kind of fires before in history anywhere in the world. So that's another place to connect the dots. And then with respect to uh, stronger hurricanes, I mean, seeing Hurricane Patricia off the coast of Mexico a few years ago reach 215 mile per hour winds, I think it was pretty unlikely we would have seen that. Or as, Certainly, uh, the odds of a storm like that happening were increased by having uh, warmer ocean waters. And that was a really scary storm to me, because imagine seeing that storm occur offshore Miami. Well, and the uh, strongest storms and the ones that have been in our vicinity here, Hurricane Andrew, the 1935 storm, for example, Michael wasn't that far away, were all those fairly small, super fast intensifying storms. Every one of yeah, them was a Patricia type storm, right? Yeah, yeah. one of the studies I wrote up last year was the fact that we were seeing a lot more of these rapidly intensifying storms, and that was connected pretty definitively to climate change. And that's a very serious sort of thing, because now you don't have as much warning time when you're putting out those warnings, and you might not get everybody out of the way who needs to go. Is there a consensus that uh, hurricanes are moving more slowly uh, in the warmer climate? I know there have been some papers that have indicated that, but is your sense that uh, that's a consensus at this point or, or still in the theory stage? 
Yeah, that's an early result. I mean, that research is pretty new. It just started coming out last year. In fact, I saw a study just this week which looked at forecasts for the end of the century over Texas, and the climate models are pretty unified, saying that over Texas, we expect to see faster moving storms. Just because the Bermuda High is expected to shift farther to the west, bring more south to north blowing winds there, and the uh, you know, southwest monsoon is expected to also increase the south to north blowing winds over Texas. So maybe over certain regions, we're not going to see slower moving storms. We're just going to have to watch that. That's a very uh, early sort of research topic. Yeah, that was my sense too. Going back to when you started the blog in 2005 and then this hellacious hurricane season, uh, now after nearly 15 years, do those blogs really stand out to you as sort of the most important ones uh, or the most intense ones that you did or you know have other things kind of superseded that now that that 14 15 years have gone by you know i still get emails from people who were in new orleans in august of 2005 as katrina was approaching saying you know i'm so glad i read your blog and got the scoop on you know what was happening because you know we were not being told to evacuate and you were telling us that i mean I may have saved some people's lives that day, and uh, mm -hmm. that certainly is an, a unique sort of uh, a blog post I've done. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously I was here for Hurricane Andrew, and to yeah. this day I hear from innumerable people that, you know, remember that, that uh, night like it was yesterday. Yeah, and uh, aside from uh, hurricanes... Some of the talk I've done, uh, one of the features I'm very interested in is the flood control system on the Mississippi River. I wrote a three-part series last year talking about the old river control structure, which is an Army Corps of Engineers set of dams, basically, that regulates the flow of the Mississippi and keeps it from changing its channel. And a lot of people don't know that we've got an Achilles heel in America where if that structure were to fail, the Mississippi River would change course and no longer go past uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge and cause an economic catastrophe. So a lot of these vulnerabilities in our uh, infrastructure, I like to emphasize. Uh, also, seawalls. I like to talk about, you know, where do we have seawalls? Where are they needed? Because as the sea level rises and hurricanes grow more intense, we're certainly going to need a lot more of those type of structures. Yeah, and the old uh, old river, what's it called? The old river... Old River Control Structure. Old River Control Structure. Obviously, that was a prominent player in your book, and we'll talk about that oh, uh, yeah. here, here <laughs> coming up in just a second. So uh, let's go back to, oh, first of all, before we finish with your blog, so you moved the blog now, and you have a new home for the blog, which I've been uh, reading it there. So tell us the new address for the blog. Yeah, I'm at yaleclimateconnections.org. It's a nonprofit that does climate change stuff, and now they've gotten into the business of extreme weather and, and current weather, uh, they did, which they really weren't into before I came <laughs> along. So uh, now they're, you know, writing my daily posts when there's a storm. I talked about, you know, Faye for three days in a row last week. Right, right. And uh, it's a great uh, it's a great site and it's a very well put together site. Uh, so you can what what is it? You The drop down says you can search for for Jeff Masters, but the drop down says uh, says what? What's I, the, Eye on the storm. Eye on the storm. That's right. Area, eye area, eye yep. on the storm. Right. All right. Let's talk. talk uh, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, well, I was going to go on to, to climate. Do you have anything else about, sure. about the blog? No, no, go ahead. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, here I am in uh, Miami Beach. The Miami being sort of the climate uh, change capital of the United States. And in terms of big cities, really one of the most prominent uh cities in the world that has a serious climate issue. The road right in front of this building here was the first road that I know of that was actually raised because of climate change. And they they took out the old sewer system that was a gravity system. And they put in a very sophisticated system with pumps and generators and and whatnot to handle not just uh, any kind of storm surge, which really it was raised. It, it kind of acts as a barrier for storm surge but also for heavy rain during uh, high tide because the high tides are higher than they used to be. And so they used mm -hmm. to come up into the road. 
And now they've raised the road, so we, we don't uh, have that problem anymore. Now, Miami and local governments are, are very aware of the uh, climate threat. I mean, there's a lot of talk from government officials. It's not a political thing here. Everybody acknowledges, although the changes, changes are slow. Do you think it's, it's hard to talk to people about climate because it's such a big topic? I mean, it just feels overwhelming. It, it, I find, you know, I talk about it, but it doesn't have the same impact as talking about hurricanes. People can relate to hurricanes, especially here in South Florida, very kind of viscerally. Uh, some people that live right near the water can relate to climate because now they're seeing water up in their yard and they never saw it before. But for most of the people in the city, even though they're boiling in this hot summer, uh, it's it's less tangible somehow. I, I don't know. Well, what, what do you think is the the biggest challenge in communications about climate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't <clears throat> grab your attention. It sneaks up on you. For instance, uh, think about heat waves. I mean, they kill about 1,500 Americans per year, but you're not going to read much about, you know, this devastating heat wave killing people versus, say, a hurricane comes in and kills 10 people. I mean, it's a lot more dramatic and it's a lot more amenable to the, the press cycle. Uh, another thing is air pollution. I mean, in the U.S., air pollution kills between 100,000 and 200,000 people per year. Yet, you know, mm -hmm. it's a quiet thing. You, you don't see, see on the death certificate, you know, died from air pollution. You can only back it out after the fact doing an epi epidemiological study. So it's very hard for the human brain, I think, to deal with these sorts of throw, uh, slow existential threats versus, you know, oh, there's a big storm going to hit and the tree's going to fall on me. You know, it's different parts of our brain are active there. And I agree with you. It's extremely difficult to convey the threat we face from many different uh, factors from climate change. And the urgency. I'm yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's like, well, with a pandemic type of urgency, if you are extruing stuff, it makes a huge difference. And there's an extreme urgency now to do things as rapidly as we can to uh, keep it from being even worse than it's going to be now. I mean, it's too late to some degree. We're already locked into devastating consequences from climate change in the next few decades. But we do have time if we act quickly to keep it from being catastrophic changes. Yeah, the pandemic is actually an interesting analogy, isn't it? I mean, the, the way the, if you let the, the virus get out of control, then it is so much harder to get it back in control, as right. we've seen, than uh, if you do it from the beginning, like they did in New York, and then they have it under control. And then you can actually have people goofing around a little bit, and you don't end up with some catastrophic explosion of, of uh, spread of the virus. Yeah, and it's like with any you know emergency situation, the time to prepare is beforehand, not to react afterwards, because then you're you know scrambling and you don't you know you go putting out one fire after another. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. That's human nature. So uh, going back to whether underground or just in general, weather on the internet. Where do you think weather on the internet is going? You know, it used to be that people got their weather from a guy on TV, so they got some explanation with the weather, just by the, the nature of it, a, a guy or a woman on TV. And now they glance at their phone and, and they get little snippets of information in various ways on social media uh, and so forth. So, you know, how do you think this is going to come together? Is this an evolutionary thing or are we stuck now in a situation where people on an average daily basis just are less informed about the weather than, than they were back when their local TV meteorologist was their main source? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think it will go more towards, you know, small mobile devices. We're already seeing that in uh, the weather business. I mean, one of the reasons I was laid off uh, last year is just because it's getting h harder to monetize websites you know, because most people are using mobile and mm -hmm. you don't get, you know, high paying ads on mobile as easily as you do on a desktop system. So. Yeah, I think that trend will continue. People are going to get their weather from mobile devices. Yeah, and there, so therefore they get kind of low, less robust level of information, right? Yeah, I think it's a, Absolutely. I think it's a big problem moving forward. On our last yeah. podcast, uh, Eli Jackson, I don't know if you know Eli from, oh yeah, I know Eli, yeah, sure. sure, from National Weather Service headquarters, was talking about the hazard simplification 
project where they're uh, eliminating the advisory category of alert, like winter okay. weather advisory. So they're only going to have watches and warnings. Now, it doesn't really affect people in Florida so much because people here think of an advisory as being a hurricane advisory, which is a whole different use of the same word, which is problematic yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. But the the reason for the change related to floods and like no flood advisories, no uh, various snow kinds of snow, ad, yeah, winter <laughs> weather advisories, all that kind of thing, yep. is because people couldn't, didn't know, uh, they did a survey, 14% of the people actually understood what it meant to go from a watch to an advisory versus a watch to a warning. Do you have thoughts on how uh, this system could work, or whether, or whether you like the idea of getting rid of the advisory category and only having watches and warnings as sort of official alert levels? I think it's probably a good try to see if it makes sense to do this for a while. In general, yeah, I think... Uh, the communication of threat is something we need to work on in this country. We don't do a very good job of it in a lot of cases. Uh, hurricanes are an example of that. It's, uh, you know, the Saffir Simpson category is outdated. We can't really fully warn for the type of threat based on that one, two, three, four, five system because there's so much that goes on besides the wind, which is what that rating is. So maybe we need to go to like a European system where they've got a yellow alert, an orange alert, and a red alert mm -hmm. and just you know, color code things. And uh, the red alert is basically for something unprecedented. You don't use it very often, so people will. Yeah, they actually surveyed that. And the problem that they ran into is we have all these scales in the world now, including emergency management scales that use colors. So the emergency managers were the ones that were concerned about uh, putting these colors into the weather business. I actually agree with you, though. I think that the media alarm systems they use in Europe, uh, some version of that is is appropriate and would be good if we looked at it holistically, including the emergency scales, and tried to make all this stuff fit together. It feels like to me. So they they did all this surveying, and they found that, that warning was very well established. Watch a little less so, but decently so. Although in English, they're both words that begin with wa it's a really yeah. unfortunate thing about uh about english so for now anyway watches and warnings are going to stay but advisories are going to go away so i read your book uh the uh, eye of the superstorm uh, and it was uh, i i really enjoyed the the yarn but i got what you were trying to do by kind of revealing thing getting people thinking about really the threats right um so I was working on a novel at one point uh, back in the early 2000s, and I found it really hard. So this book, I Have a Superstorm, is is a novel. It's a, with made-up characters and a, a storyline and so forth. I found it very hard because every time I'd stop working on it after I'd been into it for a while, I'd lose track of where the characters were in their arcs and, and all, you know, and I just found that hard. So I ended up... Uh, just stopping that and starting on the Hurricane Almanac, which I could do in individual pieces because I'd write about a certain historic storm. I'd write about a certain topic, and then that piece had a beginning and an end, right? And then it was a matter of putting the pieces together as opposed to trying to weave a story through it. How did you, or why did you decide to do a novel, and how was that experience? Yeah, it started back in 2010, so it's been 10 years. Wow. And I realized that writing science just wasn't getting the job done. People, when presented with facts, don't change their worldviews a lot of times. They'll just say, oh, uh, you know, I'll go get some alternative facts from some other place. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you can't reach people through facts a lot of times. You've got to reach them through emotion, through mm -hmm. storytelling. So I said... You know, I'm frustrated with not being able to convey the urgency of climate change through science writing. Let me try science fiction writing. So, <laughs> yeah, silly me. This yeah, is yeah. Easy, right? Uh, yeah, well, 10 years later, uh, I finally managed to finish it off. And the, the tough part, I mean, I got, you know, I know how to science write. Right? So I, I, I had the science down really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the plot was a little harder, but still, I, I had a, a pretty good plot, I thought. And I was able to put that together. But character development, that's rough. I mean, it's getting hard. the people to behave realistically. I mean, oh, what, what a struggle. So 
you know, I wrote some really lousy uh, chapters over the years. Mm. And I just took an entire years off too, or I didn't write on it. And then finally, well, once I, I wasn't working full time anymore last year, I was able to really buckle down and finish it off. So, well, how about uh, COVID? Did COVID uh, contribute to your having time to finish it off? Yeah, absolutely. That mm -hmm. was my my quarantine uh, exercise was uh, mm -hmm. finishing off the novel, and uh, uh, it, it was a, a nice sort of space to have. I mean, I you know can't go anywhere. I'm right. here in Michigan in the, the March. I Maybe mean, what are you going to do? Yeah, here we are. So, yeah. right. I worked on my novel. Yeah. So without giving away too much, uh, it's based on your knowledge of climate issues and extreme weather and your experience uh, as a research scientist flying on, on a research aircraft um, during Hurricane Hugo in, in 1989. I know that was one of the epic experiences of your life, sort of like my experience with mm -hmm. Hurricane Andrew here. Yeah. And, uh, tell us about that experience and what technology exists today that would kind of keep that from happening again or or do you think it you know it would be avoided today? So the planes that I was flying on back then are still flying today. It's the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft. And back then, there weren't restrictions on how low an altitude you could fly at to go into a hurricane. And it turns out that we were doing a special study to look at the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere at low levels. And we flew into Hurricane Hugo when we shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. We were at 1,500 feet. We thought it was only going to be a Category 3, and it turned out to be a Category 5. So we got in over our heads big time. And uh, hit some extreme turbulence in the eye wall, six Gs of acceleration, lost an engine, caught on fire. Uh, fortunately, we popped into the calm eye, uh, and the pilot was able to pull us up up 900 feet above the ocean. Mm -hmm. So uh, that can't happen anymore because you're not allowed to go into a hurricane at an altitude that low. You have to go in at 10,000 right. feet or higher. Right. So from that standpoint, uh, it's much less likely, but Still, uh, they had a flight uh, back in 2007 into Hurricane Felix where they hit four Gs mm -hmm. and uh, were forced to abort and go back to base. So every now and then, you know, the hurricane hunters get one of these WAPO storms that is dangerous, even if you're flying, you know, at high altitudes. So uh, eventually, I think drones are going to have to be where we're going to go because we shouldn't be putting people in this sort of danger if we don't have to. Yeah, we're trending that way, at least the beginnings of it. NASA has a drone program and they test it uh, every year and they fly it over to the other side of the ocean where the hurricane hunters can only go about halfway across the ocean. So uh, that seems to be the start, uh, not to mention the coyote kind of drone that that uh, you talk about, which they throw out of the airplane and then it flies around that they develop here in Miami actually over at the Hurricane uh, Research Division. So you named the storm over the Midwest in your book, which uh, I took note of. As you probably know, I was involved in uh, naming winter storms when I was at the Weather Channel, which was a somewhat controversial process, even though I thought it was the right thing then. I, I still think it's the right thing now. So are you advocating that, that we should do like the Europeans, where they name storms? Anything that's that's significant, the, the name of the storm ends up being part of the press coverage, especially in uh, Germany and Eastern Europe and places kind of in the German orbit where they name storms there at the uh, Free University of Berlin. Although now, well, now a lot of storms are being norm named by a lot of countries uh, in <clears throat> Europe. Yeah, they've been naming it longer than the Weather Channel's been naming Yes, storms. I know, back to oh. 1954 or something like that. Yeah, right. Free university And started. you can yeah. actually, as far as I know, you can buy a, a name yes, if you want. And they yes. name high-pressure systems, too. Yes, so they do. Yes, they buy do. Buy or loved one a high-pressure system. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, it would be great if the National Weather Service would get on board with this because that needs to happen, I think, to have it be successful. I agree. And if we just follow the German model where you name every single one instead of coming up with some arbitrary criteria about who gets a name or not, that might be the way to go. Might be. But uh, you're right. The National Weather Service really has to be the entity to do it. So I, I really enjoyed uh, the book. It was a really fun read, especially for people like us that – you know, love weather details. And it talks a lot about the threats along the Mississippi River and anybody that spent a lot of time studying the Louisiana problem and the challenges along the Mississippi and 
uh, read the book from 1927 or read it, mm-hmm. you know, read anything. You, you understand kind of how, what a precarious place that is. Not that Miami isn't a precarious place and the Florida Keys are precarious and Southwest Florida is pre- precarious as well. So where and when will people be able to get Eye of the Superstorm? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you're one of the early uh, test people. So oh, uh, OK, uh, my wife, my daughter are, are reading it right now. And uh, I re- actually worked on a little bit of a revision today on it. So uh, I anticipate later this summer I'm going to start submitting it to publishers. I do have at least one who's interested in it. So uh, hopefully by this fall, it'll be available. OK, uh, one concern I, I've had over the years is that uh, real life events will supersede what's happened in the story. The fiction will come true. Uh, so I always cross my fingers when we get a huge flood on the Mississippi River that it doesn't wipe out the levee system because <laughs> yeah, that's that's something that would say you know make the the book kind of moot. I mean, or if we lose New Orleans to a Cat Five or something, then right. then the book is going to be you know out of date. So let's not let those things happen. And it's a ten year uh, project. All right, all right. So your 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 blog is at, at Yale Climate Connections dot org. Yale Climate Connections dot org. Look under articles at the top and uh, Eye of the Storm. Dr. Jeff Masters uh, in Michigan with us today. Thanks very much, Jeff. Good to see you. Okay, Brian. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Jeff. I used to have a blog on uh, Weather Underground as well, and it was an honor actually to be posted there along with Jeff Masters and the other amazing people that uh, used to post there. And there was a huge community of people that would uh, read the blogs and comment on them and uh, smart Smart people. It was a, a really a wonderful location uh, on the internet. I started in 2012, uh, as I recall, and uh, did it there uh, for several years. But uh, as Jeff says, times times change, and it's just uh, the way it is. So we have a bunch of podcasts coming up at the end of the month, including Dr. Phil Klotzbach, who is the, of course, hurricane researcher that does the seasonal hurricane forecast at Colorado State. And he'll talk about this crazy uh, year so far. And, of course, we'll look ahead to the heart of hurricane season. And also, Dr. Adam Sobel, who has a fantastic podcast of his own talking about climate and hurricanes and scientists and how you get to be a scientist today. So uh, Adam Sobel will be along here in a couple of weeks as well. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your Apple or Android apps so you get notified when one of these new ones uh, pops up. So until uh, we meet again here on the next podcast, I'm Brian Norcross for Luke Doris. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Be careful. Stay safe. Wear a mask. See you next time.